Now we're going to talk about pressurization. Moving into pressurization. And these go hand in hand because to pressurize the airplane, we have to have an air source. We'll get into this. And so our environmental control and our bleed air, our air source, and then we've got a couple other elements that allow us to pressurize the aircraft. This is still covered in ATA Chapter 21. It's still considered a form of, it's part of environmental control. When we're thinking environment, it's temperature, it's pressure, it's what's called partial pressure, oxygen concentration. All that is all tied into um, environmental control. So that's why you have two different kind of two different systems that are in the same, covered in the same ATA chapter. So the whole point of pressurization is we want to maintain, you know, for our passengers, a comfortable environment, but one that's safe for them to be in for a extended period of time while the airplane is flying at very high altitudes where humans were never designed to be. Our bodies don't function at 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet very well. And so it's, it's partly for comfort. It's also for the crew. Uh, it's so that they can keep their wits about them, so that they understand what's going on. Has anyone ever been in the uh, the high altitude chamber we have here? You got to go in it? Yeah? What did you do at high altitude? How did you get? Yeah. And? <laughs> You know, that's a famous video, too. You'll see that one. What about you? You were in there? Okay. You get a headache and stuff? And jittery? Yeah. So it, the way people react, if they lose pressure, lose oxygen, can be very different. It's kind of like people react differently when they drink too much alcohol. Some people get really giddy and giggly, right? Some people get angry. Some people go straight to the hangover stage where you have the headache, okay? So you, you never know how you're going to react until you do it. So the pilots, they put them through a training where they do this, where they, they experience hypoxia to understand how their bodies react. But we don't want to find out how 300 passengers react to low oxygen, low blood oxygen saturation, right? You'll have the giddy ones over here, and you'll have the guy over here trying to pick a fight, and you'll have somebody else passed out on the floor, and, you know, and people get physically sick, so you'll have someone over here puking in the toilet, right? Sounds like a frat party, right? Oh, or a ski team party. Pressurization requirements, in order to make this work, we have to have a, something to contain the pressure known as the pressure vessel, okay? We have to have a source of air, and we've been talking about a source of air for the last hour and a half or so. And then we need to control the, um, that air going out. We can't just keep pumping air in and in and in and in. We got to get it, we want it to turn over. We want to control what the pressure is, and we do use that by controlling how fast it flows out. So pressure vessel, this is our high strength fuselage, okay? Our aluminum fuselage. It doesn't, you know, we, we say high strength, high strength fuselage, they're very thin, right? You've seen some of the sheet metal these are made out of, 21 thousandths, 32 thousandths, 40 thousandths, 60 thousandths. They're not very thick, but they're very strong when that, when that skin's loaded in tension, when it's pressurized inside and the pressure is low on the outside. However, there are limits to what they can handle. And so that's our differential pressure rating. So some light aircraft that are pressurized can handle a max differential of 3 to 5 PSI. Some of your larger recip stuff, this is like the, the King Air and that kind of thing. Uh, five and a half PSI, and then turbine aircraft can be upwards of nine PSI or, or even more. A lot of the newer aircraft are going to, or going above that, upwards of 11 PSI when you start talking about like uh, composite aircraft and that kind. Now, the newer aircraft, so what that means is light aircraft, they're limited to a certain altitude because it's the pressure inside versus the pressure outside. We have to maintain a pressure inside that is <clears throat> that is below 10,000 feet, okay? 
And below 14,000 feet, or anything above 14,000 feet, the crew has to start wearing oxygen masks. But we want it to stay ideally below 10,000 feet in the cabin. So a light aircraft, you know, it may not be able to fly much above 15 or 20,000 feet before you've hit that pressure differential. Okay. Larger reefs, they can fly a little bit higher, maybe 25,000 feet. But large turbine aircraft, some of these turbine aircraft, not even large, a lot of corporate jets actually fly higher than large jets. These are going to need to be able to fly somewhere at 40 or even upwards of 50,000 feet or more and still have a cabin that's at 10 10,000 feet or less. So what it means is, why, why do we keep bumping this up? Well, those stronger fuselages, it, it doesn't mean they're going to fly much higher. We've reached kind of our maximum. The maximum these, that, that these aircraft are going to fly in that 40 to 50,000 feet range, that's about as high as any civilian aircraft is ever going to be able to go with a turbofan engine. Above that, it, the, the, it just doesn't work. So why do we up the pressure differential? What does that allow us to do? If we're not flying any higher, why do we want to have a bigger t pressure differential? Why did they go to all the trouble on the 787 to up that to something like 11? Or why do they? Why would you do that? What does that mean you can do? What? Lower cabin altitude. Why do we want a lower cabin altitude? It's more comfortable for the passengers. That's why. OK? So. You know, maybe where, you know, a plane built in the 1990s, early 2000s, if it's flying at 40,000 feet, its cabin's at 9,000 feet. You know, the 787 is flying at 40,000 feet, its cabin's at 5,000 feet. Okay. Once you start getting above 5,000 feet, altitude does start to affect people, not in the ways that we see with hypoxia, where they get crazy or sick or angry or mad or loopy, but it does cause fatigue. That's where a lot of that fatigue comes from when people fly, jet lag. So we can minimize that by increasing that, that pressure differential. Our source of air, we talked about bleed air, direct bleed air from the engine. Smaller aircraft sometimes have a separate compressor or, like we mentioned, 787, no bleed architecture. It has to have, um, it has compressors that are electrically driven. So not even on my list here. But that's where the compressed air comes from for that airplane. So that air gets pumped into our pressure vessel, tries to blow it up like a balloon, inflate it, right? Keeps pressure in there. And then we control how quickly that air is able to leave in order to ultimately control what the cabin altitude is and to control what that differential pressure is. Because we don't want to exceed the max differential pressure of our fuselage because it's really not a good day when the fuselage goes pop. Aloha Airlines, fuselage go pop, you know what I'm talking about? What's that? That's when the top of the plane peeled away. Now that was a fatigue issue, it wasn't an overpressurization, that was because they fly a lot more cycles and at that time maintenance was all based on time. And they're flying a little higher lines. Yeah, they flew a lot of short cycles, so they didn't get to their time limits to do their non-destructive testing inspections to look for rivets uh, cracking, forming on the rivets in the fuselage or around the rivets in the fuselage. And that changed the way maintenance was done. If a plane's operated short hops, but a lot of them a day versus long haul, you do maintenance differently now. But if you overpressurize, you can cause the same thing to happen. You can cause premature fatigue uh, or, or, even worse, catastrophic failure. So controlled leakage controls the you know, cabin pressure, the delta pressure. We also control the rate of change. We don't want that change to happen too quickly. People really don't like it when we change pressures too quickly. Why not? You get ear, you feel it in your ears. Your inner ear is not happy if you change pressures too fast. Right? We want people's ears to have time to kind of pop and equalize. It hurts. We've, I've been in a plane where we were doing pressurization on the ground, and we had an outflow valve pop. We went from pressurized to unpressurized like that, and I thought my head was going to explode. It hurts. Now, we didn't build nearly that much pressure in the 727 but because that cart could only do a little bit. But if you're using it, if you're doing it off the engines, you can build a lot of pressure in these things on the ground. And it did not feel good. 
but you're going to have those outflow valves. They're typically divided. You have your primary outflow valve that's going to control, you know, most of the time control stuff. You often have safety valves, which is a positive pressure relief valve because we don't want to exceed that max uh, differential pressure. Negative pressure relief valve, very important that the cabin never goes below the outside pressure. Why is that? This structure is not made to take compression. It is made to be in tension. Think about like a pop can. You can take a pop can, a closed pop can, you can shake it up, whatever. It, you know, usually they stay good, right? But once you've opened a pop can and you crunch it from the outside, it takes barely any force to crush it down. The fuselage works the same way. So we never want that inside to be at a lower pressure than the outside. And then a dump valve, which opens at uh, when the airplane's on the ground to prevent, we don't want accidental, we don't want it to pressurize on the ground, mainly for comfort reasons. Okay, as well as fatigue. We don't want to be pressurizing every time we start the engines and causing fatigue cycles on the airplane. Now, I've got four listed here. A lot of airplanes maybe only have two or have three or some have four. Um, but you can oftentimes, you can have valves that do multiple jobs. Okay, you're going to always have at least two, though, because you've got to have your main primary control and you've got to have some kind of a backup. So outflow valves, and these can be your primary outflow valve, they can be your dump valve, they can be your safety valve, your overpressurization valve. They come in a couple main types. The first type is this one shown here. This is a diaphragm valve, and they can be controlled. This, is, this one happens to be pneumatically controlled. There's an aneroid in here. you got different pressures coming from different air sources, and this poppet can move up and down. This is like the one that's in the trainer that we, we played with in lab. Okay. A pneumatic one, but they can also be electric. You can have an electric motor up here that does it. Control cabin pressure also controls the rate of change by how much it opens that. You've also seen this style. The 727 out there has this. This is a door type. Again, these can be electrically or pneumatically operated. Okay? The 727 we have happens to be electric operated. You use a switch, it drives a little electric motor, but you can also put a pneumatic aneroid actuator on here that opens and closes these, these doors. Okay, and same thing, still controls pressure and rate of change. Positive pressure relief valves are almost always pneumatically controlled and operated. And that is, if we hit that max pressure, we want it to pop open, even if we have like an electrical failure or a vacuum system failure or, or a pneumatic system failure. So they detect pressure rises and they can safely vent the air. Here's the, they got the aneroid on them and then they can pop open. Now. They can do two things. One, if that pressure gets too high, if we are going to exceed our max differential pressure, they'll open to prevent it from, from going above it. The other thing is a lot of them are built so that if the pressure is changing too quickly, say our outflow valve slams shut rather than closing nice and slowly, these will also open to help keep the rate of change from running away. Again, we don't want to blow out everybody's eardrums in the in the airplane, okay? It also that if you have too quick of a change, that can cause overstress in the fuselage because it's stretching and, and could potentially lead to overpressurizing the fuselage. So they can detect not just the pressure, but the pressure rise, the rate of change, and open if either the pressure gets too high or the rate of change gets too high. Negative pressure relief valves, these can be a couple different types. We've got a door type. Everyone find this on the 727? Did anyone go up and actually push on it when you had to identify it? So it's just, it literally is a spring-loaded door. You get up on a ladder, you can shove your hand in there, it'll open, right? All, when the airplane's pressurized, it's just held shut by air pressure. But if you get negative pressure, it just, it just flips open. It, it doesn't take much pressure to overcome the spring that holds it shut and push it open. Another style is a poppet style like this. It's a circle. So this, this is on the inside. This can push. You know, these springs don't have a lot of force on them, just enough to hold it in place so it'll seal when the plane pressurizes. But if you get a negative pressure, if there's more pressure on the outside here, it'll be able to push this poppet valve in. And again, prevent that from never going negative of the outside pressure. And then finally, the dump valve. And this can be door type, it can be butterfly type, it can actually be the, the poppet type. And oftentimes it's combined with safety valves or other things. 
Um, but essentially it's you can lock a valve in the fully open position to prevent the airplane from pressurizing on the ground. And these are almost always tied to the weight on wheel switches. So if the airplane's sitting on the ground and they're in normal operation, this thing's going to be open. When your wheels lift off the ground, when you're landing your lifts off the ground, they close and then your pressurization system can start to operate. For maintenance purposes, we sometimes have to override that automatic operation in order to close them on the ground if we need to pressurize and do that kind of thing. So they'll have some kind of a means to be able to do it. Usually in the cockpit, it's just simply a switch. Go to, go to ground test mode and it closes the dump valve. In flight, it can also be used to relieve cabin pressure in an emergency. And what I mean by that is the biggest reason isn't a pressure emergency, but rather a smoke emergency. And that is if you get a cabin full of smoke, remember these are at the back of the cabin. The bleed air coming in tends to enter near the front of the cabin. So if we open this thing in flight, what's gonna happen to the smoke? It's gonna get sucked which direction? It's gonna get pulled to the back of the cabin and down. And that gets it away from the flight crew, the pilots who need to be able to fly the aircraft. Okay. So that front to back, top to bottom, front to back. So here's where a lot of these things live. So CPS, CPCS, cabin pressure control system, computers that control all this. This plane does have, you can see there's actually an outflow valve further forward. There's a positive pressure relief valve, negative pressure relief valve. You got your air coming in and into our pressure vessel. Our various controls up here, most of the time, they're kept in an auto situation, although the crew does typically set the pressure. They set what they want the cabin altitude to be. Okay. I'll go ahead and stop there.